this, this thing out of scotch or something here, cheers. 100 years to the Fed. I, I should have cheers that one, but um, I'm actually happy that uh, Mr. Pella brought up the limitation of governments to pass bill of attainders, actually. But my speech is going to draw reference to a different type of bill that the Constitution limits, and that's bills of credit. And I'll do a better job of elaborating exactly what that is in a little bit. But uh, today I specifically wanted to talk about the 100 year anniversary of the Fed, which was just a few days ago, a few days before Christmas. And the Federal Reserve is our current national bank. And I also wanted to talk about a brief history about our national banks and why they've been controversial since even the very beginnings of our republic. Um, Specifically, I wanted to talk about the Federal Reserve's inception. And the Federal Reserve uh, basically was conceived off the coast of Georgia on an island known as Jekyll Island. Now, an influential senator named Nelson Aldrich got together with many private bankers on the property of J.P. Morgan at the time. And this bill was essentially crafted without, um, without really the legislator legislature being involved. I mean, essentially, it was basically a bunch of bankers that got together with this one influential senator and crafted the bill there. Well, this is a little bit of a problem constitutionally because Article 5 of the Constitution specifically says that states can't be deprived of their equal suffrage in the Senate. So, I mean, let alone the concept of unelected officials crafted legislation by which we now live. Um, but basically, Woodrow Wilson, the pen of which signed this bill eventually in 1913, set off a chain of events that has had catastrophic implications on all of us sitting here today, no matter whether we know it or not. And I say that uh, very explicitly because of two potential problems with that. And those problems happen despite a lot of information that goes out about this. A lot of it doesn't go out in public schools and I don't know, personally, when I grew up, I thought that, you know, the Federal Reserve was a legitimate part of government. We needed to stave off, you know, depressions and recessions. But to me now, I mean, study longer, that's hogwash. Private so, company. Yeah, private, well, it's a private cartel of companies, indeed. Um, so, basically, the, the powers of the Fed are important now because, number one, the Federal Reserve prints fiat currency. And it's very hard to see how this has been a good thing because... The dollar now is about, about worth 4% of what it was in 1913. I mean, you can just see this from going to the supermarket over the last 10 years. The, the price of goods are exploding, and you know a lot of people don't even recognize that. Um, but a bigger factor is the manipulation of interest rates that the Federal Reserve engages in. And that is done, um, and it's an impediment to liberty because of the fact that the free markets thrive off of voluntarism and individual decisions in buying goods and services. Well, when the manipulation of the interest rates occurs, people may not invest in a certain firm where they otherwise would. They might hold that money, invest it somewhere else. And due to you know, a vast series of these malinvestments that wouldn't occur during free market conditions, that's what causes the boom and bust cycles, the very boom and bust cycles that the proponents of the Fed used to justify its inception to begin with. Um, national banks have been extremely controversial since the beginning of our, of our republic, as I said, um, ever since 1791, because that's when the advent of the first national bank went into being. And it went into being when part of the Hamiltonian economic plan called for one. Uh, Hamilton believed that it was necessary um, for various reasons. Now, Thomas Jefferson took the opposing view, the Secretary of the State at the time, and George Washington didn't really fully know what to think. So he asked his Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, and his Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, write separate constitutional opinions on what you think about this, what you think about the constitutionality of this, because this thing had already passed the, passed the Congress. It was on the desk of Washington. Um, well. Jefferson opposed it. He basically said that this would open up a boundless field of power. He, he looked to Amendment 10, quoting it in his opinion, saying that, you know, this isn't one of the delegated powers to Congress in Article 1, Section 8. Um, Hamilton took the exact other view while he admitted in his text that the Constitution was silent on the power to create a bank. He said that the necessary and proper clause, this creates, you know, implied powers, these powers that it's, it's an untapped reservoir of powers that we may need to uh, take in some, in some cases. 
Now, basically, Hamilton had the ear of Washington. Washington eventually signed that, and we got the first national bank. And people learned from it. Um, but this was interesting, because Hamilton, just three years prior, during Federalist 33, and I really recommend it, he goes through and specifically says that the Necessary and Proper Clause does no such thing. Hamilton said that, you know, this thing's only vested with a certain, uh, certain specified powers, being the Constitution. And he said this is so clear a proposition that moderation itself can scarcely listen to the railings which have been so copiously vented against this part of the plan. So he's saying basically that the Necessary and Proper Clause doesn't justify this. It doesn't create new power. And then three years later, you can see how he completely turns his opinion. Now, the first national bank was chartered for 20 years. The second national bank was chartered for 20 years as well. And Andrew Jackson uh, made it his chief political mission to make sure that the, the second national bank did not get extended. And we'll you know, discuss that a bit later. But basically, the Constitution gives many assurances of hard money currency now, that now the Fed rejects. Now the Fed prints fiat currency, and fiat is money that's not backed by specie. It's not backed by gold or silver, or precious commodities. Um, and the insurances can be found in Article 1, Section 10. Um, and the, the reason for them are paramount. And during the critical period of US history, which is basically when the Articles of Confederation were in effect, uh, there was rampant inflation caused by the Continentals, whose value depreciated within just a few years. Meanwhile, the states were creating their own bills of credit, with, which became worthless. States would even try to pass legislation saying that, you know, you have to pay back your debtors in these bills of credit that were worthless, and you can see how the owners of that debt had problems with it. Well, Roger Sherman and James Wilson in the Philadelphia Convention moved to insert coin money, and that's a specific power that uh, money has to be tied to valuable assets and nor emit bills of credit nor make anything but gold and silver a tender in the payment of debts. It's in Article 1, Section 10. Um, Madison's notes show that Sherman said this is a favorable crisis for crushing paper money. So he thought that, you know, this experience leaves us with the impression that uh, money that's not backed by currency is abominable. It's terrible. It's despotic to do that. Um, even those who believed in the National Bank at that time, and in the first National Bank, didn't believe that it should ever have the power to take it off the gold standard, or take it off a precious commodity standard. Even Alexander Hamilton, a guy that you know I rail against, um, some, some people like him more than me, obviously, but there's, there's others that were proponents of the National Bank, like Gouverneur Morris and Ro Robert Morris of Pennsylvania. They're lesser known, but nonetheless they were. But even Hamilton said that, uh, that he didn't think that they should do that. He said that um, the emitting of paper money by the authority of government is wisely prohibited to the individual states by the national constitution. And the spirit of that prohibition ought not to be disregarded by the government of the United States. So none of the founders, not the Federalists, not the Republicans, not uh, uh, the Anti-Federalists, which generally called themselves Republicans, None of them believed that that was con conceivable because they realized that the power is, is too great in a free society. Um, there were more than just these famous figures that opposed it. Uh, Thomas McCain, whose picture is on the left, was from Pennsylvania. He moved between Pennsylvania and Delaware, but he's an un unknown and underappreciated founder. He's a signatory of the Declaration of Independence, later a signatory member of the Constitution. He said that I think he puts it perfectly here, calling, you know, fiat pernicious. He says, sir, some security will be offered for the discharge of honest contracts and put an end to the pernicious speculation upon paper emissions, a medium which has undermined the morals and the, relaxed the industry of the people, and from which one half of the controversies in our courts of justice has arisen. So this was a widespread fear that, you know, bills of credit could be diffused into the populace. And the last quote is the most powerful to me, and uh, I'm a Tennessean, so part of me just has to love this guy as Andrew Jackson, although I would have problems with him in other, other facets, but on this he was right, because he dedicated his political life to the destruction of the National Bank in his time. He said that it is a den of vipers and thieves, and when he said that, he slammed his fist into a table in Philadelphia and said, by the grace of the eternal God, I will rout you out. Well, 
I think that we should share that same vitriol that Jackson did in opposing it today. So, um, that's basically all I have. I'd like uh, you guys... Fight him, they put him on the $20 bill. Yeah, isn't that the ultimate <laughs> irony, right? So he's on the $20 bill. That, that is the ultimate irony. That's a funny comment. But uh, I'd love you guys to check out my website. I write constitutional blog entries. Um, I finished my book. I'm going through editing it. That'll be available soon, too. And I really appreciate your audience, as always. So thank you guys very much. <laughs> That was, Craig, I was going to say that same exact thing. And Jefferson on the $2 bill. Funny how the two biggest proponent, or opponents of centralized banking end up on our fiat money. Funny how that works. Um, Dave and I did a podcast to test out the new equipment. Uh, was that last Friday? Yes, sir. And is it going to be on your website? Are you going to post that up on the website? Uh, eventually, most likely, yeah. Okay. Um, Dave takes the constitutional arguments, I take the economic arguments against the Fed. It's probably about 30 minutes, and maybe some of you guys will find it interesting, some boring, but maybe you'll learn something. So check it out when it does come, uh, come on his website. Okay, now the reason I asked you guys to come here tonight, brave the cold weather, I don't have that global warming jacket, um, is to talk about an event called Caucus Night.